Every revolution begins with language. So when did gender and sex start meaning something different? Um, you can actually Google uh, dictionaries way back to even the 1600s, 1700s, and you'll find that from the beginning, gender meant male or female and sex meant male or female. But gender referred to grammar. Um, and it's easier to understand this if I use the Spanish language. For example, in Spanish, if I have a male friend, I would use the word amigo. The gender of amigo is masculine. We don't say the word has sex, it has gender. Uh, if I have a female friend, I use the word amiga. The gender of amiga is feminine. So. Throughout the world, gender was understood as male or female, but as it pertained to language or things. For example, if we name a hurricane Gloria, we didn't just give the hurricane a sex, we gave it a gender. That was understood until the 1950s. For the first time, the word gender was published in the medical literature and applied to people. It was created by a sexologist and psychologist, Dr. John Money, who worked at Johns Hopkins University. He and his colleagues were taking transsexual men, men who identified as women, and putting them through so-called sex reassignment surgery. But they needed to justify this ideologically, intellectually, because they knew full well, they were men of science, Surgery doesn't change your DNA. So how can we, you know, how can we uh, justify this? And they say, oh, we're gonna tell people we are treating these men's gender. We're gonna say their gender, they, have, they don't just have a sex, but they have a gender, which is an internal sexed identity. So we're just bringing their body in line with their brain. And that is precisely the language used today to justify the chemical and surgical attack that's going on in our gender-confused children. People have a sex, nouns have a gender. <laughs> um, we have to get back to being true to language. And that's another reason we have to refuse to use these made-up pronouns like zer and z and Schools are actually allowing kids to choose their own pronouns without telling parents. It all starts with language. Language is very powerful. We must take it back. In the 1960s or so, the term gender started to be applied to people uh, in contradistinction to sex. Uh, so they, uh, this was a second wave feminist uh, group of thinkers who wanted to say that uh, sex is merely biological and then gender is a mere social construct. So of course there are certain physical differences between men and women, that's obvious, but those differences don't make a difference. Um, that the way that we see men and women behaving differently, having different expectations, different social roles, those aren't a result of biology, those are a result of culture and of a bad culture, right? This is a culture that has um, created a gender as a cultural social construct, precisely because of patriarchy in order to keep women down, et cetera, et cetera. What's fascinating right now uh, in this like, kind of um, uh, 50 years later after the 1960s is they wanna say that your gender identity determines your sex. So we actually have gone you know, 360 from you know, separating gender and sex to now saying your gender identity determines your sex. So if you feel like a woman, you are a woman, even if you have a male body. If you feel like a man, you are a man, even if you have a woman's body. Where it's entirely unclear what it means to feel like a woman. Um, how would I know what it feels like to feel like a woman? And do all women feel the same way? Right? Could you even get women to say, yes, I feel like a woman and this is what it feels like to feel like a woman? Is, is, is womanhood a feeling or is it an incarnate embodied reality? Um, and so you see um, a very interesting um, public disagreement taking place between feminists and transgender activists. Uh, feminists who are very 
uh, frustrated saying that transgender activists are actually doubling down on all of those gender stereotypes that feminists were trying to combat. Um, that, that the image of what it is to be a woman and feel like a woman and act like a woman is to wear lipstick and high heels and to have cleavage. And it's all of these kind of images of womanhood that feminists have spent you know, their lives trying to uh, respond to. We seem to be losing the word woman. Uh, so we might be called cervix havers or Never menstruators. Well, in cervical cancer campaign material, the, woman, the word woman doesn't appear. Um, menstruators, chest feeders, pregnant people. And I just thought the essence of this debate and what we're losing is, is literally the word woman. So, so my best thinking of this in terms of, you know, how to think about sex and gender is that we want to avoid two ways of going wrong. There are two different extremes. You could take the androgynous extreme and say there are no differences between men and women, no differences between male and female that make a difference. Uh, yes, there are obvious, you know, bodily differences, but none of those matter. Uh, we're entirely the same. And so this is the problem of viewing equality as sameness, right? So that would be one extreme. The other extreme is to um, overplay the differences and to pick up on things that don't really matter as if they're determinative, right? Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Um, men should study economics, women should study home economics. Uh, boys should play with G.I. Joe, girls should play with Barbie, right? And have very strict uh, gender roles, gender expectations. Um, and that actually, to my mind, contributes to some of the problems with gender dysphoria. Because if you're a boy who doesn't fit into that very narrow understanding of gender, you might come to think that you're a girl. You might say, well, look, I don't like G.I. Joe. I don't like football. Um, uh, the other boys are picking on me. They're bullying me. They're calling me a sissy and a wuss, et cetera, et cetera. And then you might cope, but maybe I'm really a girl trapped in a boy's body. So those are the two extremes. The, the virtuous mean is to, to embrace equality uh, between the sexes. Men and women are equal in their dignity, um, but there are differences that make a difference. We have different gifts, we have different vocations, uh, and that we shouldn't try to force uh, women to live as if men or men to live as if women. And to my mind, one of the big problems of uh, modern feminism, especially when it comes to uh, the economy, is to take an economy that was structured during the 18th and 19th and 20th century on the supposition that the male body was the normal way of being human, and to then try to force women to behave as if they have male bodies, right? Rather than saying, no, there are two equally human ways of existing, and we should actually have our social institutions, our market institutions, our educational institutions take the female way of being human seriously. Uh, and the needs that the female body has in terms of childbirth, in terms, in terms of mothering. And we shouldn't uh, assume that my way of being human is the normal way, and then my wife's way of being human is somehow defective or somehow secondary. Right? So we want to avoid those options of androgyny or rigid sex stereotypes and, and try to get this healthy, virtuous mean of their two complementary ways that are equally human and therefore equally need to be respected and protected.